Good morning, everybody. I'm Eric Redding, and uh, we will take just a couple minutes to let people sign on and start in a moment. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome, everybody, to the Deal Me In panel on rethinking U.S. trade and investment in post-COVID Africa. Um, I'm very happy to welcome you today. My name is Eric Redding. I'm the Division Vice President for International Development at Apt Associates, and um, we will have a very exciting panel today. Um, Lauren, I'm not able to advance the slides, if you could go ahead and advance. Okay, uh, we have that technical issue resolved. Again, my name is Eric Redding from Apt Associates, and uh, just a little bit about the work that Apt has done in um, trade development, trade investment rather. Um, Apt really works at the intersection of the public and private sectors, where we leverage um, the public sector to support the private sector and broker trade investment deals that wouldn't otherwise happen. What we look to achieve in this is to um, bring in investment and trade deals that are both inclusive and have long lasting impact. Some examples of the work that we've done um, include managing the West Africa um, Trade Investment Hub to boost the region's competitiveness and um, help process stable crops and manufactured items, as well as to mobilize finance and investment. In four years, that West Africa Trade Investment Hub mobilized $100 million in investments, $140 million, $174 million in sales, $136 million in exports, and created more than 20,000 jobs, over half of which were for women. In Egypt, our market-driven, system-strengthening approach responds to domestic and international buyer demand for a more competitive and inclusive economy. We've done that through building bridges between um, buyers and smallholder farmers. For example, we created a partnership with PepsiCo Egypt to provide inputs and training to farmers and to source high-quality potatoes in return. Uh, participating smallholder farmers have doubled their yields and income during the year of 2020, despite it being a very challenging year. So with that, I'd like to go ahead and start introducing our terrific panelists. Uh, Rob Skidmore will be our uh, moderator today, and Rob is the Chief of Sector Enterprise and Competitiveness Section at the International Trade Center. Ezekiel Odiago is the head of private sector operations at the um, Africa Investment Forum and the African Development Bank. Ezekiel is based in Johannesburg, and uh, the ADB, uh, the ADB's Africa Inter Investment Forum, is a multi-billion-dollar platform to channel investment into African businesses. Paloma Shackert is the uh, co-founder and CEO of Ethical Apparel Africa, based in New York, which is a U.S. business exporting apparel from Ghana and Benin and channeling investment into African factories. Wilson Kudi, uh, Kudigetka uh, is the CEO and founder of um, Clinic Master International. He's based in Uganda, and his expanding company is showing the commercial viability of digital health solutions in Africa. And finally, Pamela Bates is a partner in Securitas Global Risk Solutions. Um, she's based in DC and is formerly a trade policy expert at the State Department and we'll talk about risk mitigations for uh, mechanisms for investors in Africa. Um, we're really excited to have this panel together who brings together 
people who've looked um, at trade from the policy standpoint, um, actual investors and business people who are um, making trade and investment happen between the U.S. and Africa. And uh, we look forward to a very exciting conversation. And with that, I will uh, pass off to uh, Rob Skidmore as our MC for today. Thanks very much, Eric. It's a really a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to participate. Looking forward to learning a lot from uh, these distinguished panelists and then helping to kind of pull out some, some elements I think may be common across the different presentations and the different experience. Um, my job, as you said, is to be moderator. So I wanted to kind of set the stage a little bit uh, for things I think will start to come out in the discussion. And, and of course, our discussion is about uh, increasing the economic relationship between the U.S. and Africa through trade and investment, and uh, also thinking about that in terms of, of post-COVID, but post-COVID in the sense of all of the, the, the trends that COVID has accelerated. Many of them are not new, but they've become very, very rapidly uh, more important in the, in the trade and investment landscape. So my job, is, as uh, Eric said, I'm, I work at the International Trade Center managing the uh, sector and enterprise competitiveness section. Just a quick word on ITC. We're a joint agency of the UN and the WTO, and we're focused on achieving good trade. So that means a trade that has a positive development benefit. Overall, ITC promotes about a billion dollars in trade and investment a year. And my colleagues do an analysis every year, and in 2019, they found the yield of about $11 of benefit for every dollar that we put in. And we, just to give a sense of scale, we partner with about 26,000 companies a year and about 400 institutions. Uh, so, <clears throat> so I think that, that the, the work we're doing, which is especially focused on LDCs, on Sub-Saharan Africa, and a couple of other categories, uh, means that I'm going to be listening very closely to the lessons that these folks have learned and putting it to practice in my work. So uh, I think uh, that the new normal is what we're going to be looking at in this relationship, and we're going to be looking for deals both on the trade and investment side that satisfy some of these elements that are going to be guiding the new normal. And I, I'm going to bring up four categories, so resilience, digital, open and inclusive, and sustainable and climate friendly. And I do that because my colleagues uh, in the middle of last year did a, a, a wide-ranging study not only of the impacts of COVID, but also what they thought the new normal would be guided by. And I think what, as, as we look at the, how the, this potential uh, between the U.S. and Africa can be realized, it's going to be deals that are going to be successful in the medium term because they meet uh, these four categories. So the, I'm going to go in reverse order. Sustainable, we all heard about it. We've all worked on it in our career. Um, but there's been a step change in this. And I'll give you an example. We... Um, you know, it, when we went over uh, a review of tra uh, virtual trade shows that my uh, colleagues have been in, they said the first question all of the buyers is are asking is, are you sustainable? Are you certified? What categories? We also see on the consumer side, you know, a, a, a rapid and uh, significant jump in demand for sustainable products. So one example, a 30% rise in interest in uh, fair trade type products. So there, there are many ways to look at it. But, uh, and I think Africa has a lot to offer in this area, can, can, can meet and exceed this need in the medium term. The second one I want to talk about is open and inclusive. There's a lot of uh, emphasis on more transparency, uh, more inclusion, more commercial alliances. And um, we even see this in big countries who are starting to regulate due diligence and supply chains. So we hear the EU is coming with something. We hear... Uh, we know the UK has had uh, in the past. We know New Zealand has done something. In the country where I'm resident, Switzerland has done something. So there, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more emphasis on transparency and inclusion of those underserved, and it's also a massive market opportunity. And again, I think Africa has an enormous amount uh, to, to offer in this area, and we'll hear both from Paloma and from Wilson uh, on how their transactions do this. The third one, digital. So again, we talked a lot about digital before, but the jump up we've seen in my e-commerce team, for instance, on trust for, for using the internet for sales has been enormous. The, the, 
challenge that African companies have faced to be able to work remotely and become digital, we've seen many overcome it and accelerated their ability to operate this way. And we see enormous commercial opportunities in uh, fintech, in outsourcing the Wilson Zen, in uh, bringing um, you know, digital s- solutions, for instance, to power generation and to, to power metering and to other areas. So all of these medium-term projects are going to have to do well in digital, and digital is also an enormous market opportunity. The last area is resilience. So this is really, let's say, a relatively new one, and it now characterizes all we hear. And what do I mean by resilience? Um, people need to see that your supply chain, that what you're doing can outlast the next shock. So that's not going to be COVID. That's going to be something. Uh, it's going to be something else. We've seen the financial crisis. We've seen hurricanes. We've seen typhoons. We've seen drought. So there's going to be a real emphasis on building deals that are resilient. And that's, I think, where practitioners like myself um, and uh, Pamela and others can come in and help to make all these great deals that I know are there in Africa stronger and better able to make their case for why they're resilient. So I think these are four elements that we'll see uh, in, in deals that do make it in the new normal. And we keep our eye on the, on the medium term. So some reasons we can be optimistic. We are delighted, uh, our relationship with the WTO, to see that uh, Ngozi has become the first African WTO uh, Director General. And I think it changes the narrative. People will say, ha, you know, Africa is out there in a leadership position on trade. So I think these kinds of narrative points are important and people will really start to think differently. Of course, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is going to build to a huge impact, open up markets massively, reduce transaction costs. We're, we're super focused on how we can help it do that. Of course, there's a slow start. It's a massively ambitious agreement, but even in areas like services, there's huge, huge potential. The third is just U.S. Africa. The U.S. has created, has come on with a new focus through the Prosper Africa program. 17 agencies, billions of dollars. Uh, uh, huge uh, types of support, feasibility, financing, all sorts of things that if we connect them correctly can make a huge difference to improving, uh, de-risking uh, and improving the feasibility of, of deals. And I think the last one is investors and buyers are going to be looking for variety, diversification, and returns. So we see initially uh, Africa had a lower drop in investment than most during COVID. Uh, and right now, you know, UNCTAD is saying, okay, maybe some of the types of investment like project financing have gone down more. Um, but I'm bullish on the fact people are looking for long-term returns and Africa can, can bring those. Whereas in my home country, the U.S. or where I live in Switzerland, returns are going to be low and markets are going to be rocky. So here's some things let's, let's watch out for over the next, uh, the, the presentations and then as we come into the panel. Um, some things that that we're focused on. First of all, I mean, we believe in free trade and a rules-based system, so we've got to keep trade investment open and efficient. And our analysis indicates some measures, non-tariff measures, and other kinds of barriers have gone up during this period. So we need to make sure we keep an eye on that and that we keep these channels open, not to increase the barriers, if, but to leave policy space. Second is, how do we coordinate assistance? So Prosper Africa is really an attempt to do that. And I think with Wilson and with Palomo, we've got examples of folks who've done their own coordinating, help, you know, have worked with multiple different uh, agencies, including the ITC uh, and APT, and can show us the value of this kind of coordination. Third, building alliances and partnerships for these resilient supply chains. So we're going to hear good examples of partnership building and some good advice on how to make those partnerships work. These are, these are really critical in this day of being open and inclusive. Uh, I think we need to see trade and investment as a continuum. So a lot of the investment is going to be looking for trade opportunities, especially under AFCFTA. And last, there is so much potential on services, value added, and knowledge sectors. Those are really where I think we're going to find the big, big payoffs. Uh, and energy is one of those areas. Uh, outsourcing healthcare, so you'll hear more about those. So th- those are just some things to have in mind as we listen to the to the uh, the, the great presentations coming up, and as we as you start to form questions, and I encourage you to come into the chat, uh, start to think uh, of your questions and share them with us, and we'll try to bring them out during the panel discussion at the end. 
So without uh, any further ado, let me pass uh, this to Ezekiel to talk to us about the investment side. Over to you, Ezekiel. Yeah, thank you very much, Rob, for that um, excellent um, introduction. And um, thank you, uh, audience and uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really looking forward to a very interactive session with you. And uh, my job here is to really throw some light on the, um, the investment opportunities, particularly when it comes to infrastructure and trade in Africa. And I will kick off my presentation by firstly just giving a sense of what our impact is, um, but then dive into how you do business in Africa and what the opportunities are. And I think um, we're really looking for more engagement from the U.S. Uh, on Africa's uh, investment and trade opportunities. So um, pretty much um, what the impacts of COVID has been on the landscape. I mean, um, Africa, I mean, as in everywhere else in the world, um, I mean, this is very unprecedented uh, time. Um, but Africa has fed... Uh, Quite better so far, I say so far because um, I mean we're seeing the second wave, um, but this has not been without uh, huge uh, human costs. And I think um, I really want to stress on the side of the cost. I mean we've seen close to about 40 million uh, people fall into extreme poverty, and about 30 million losing their jobs, and these jobs uh, need to be uh, recovered, and even more jobs need to be created. So um, this has been quite a very difficult time for Africa. I mean, it's been uh, pretty much uh, the worst recession we've seen in the last uh, two decades or so. And um, why we've seen uh, contraction in, in growth rates, I mean, about 3% uh, last year. I mean, we're seeing, we're hoping and uh, looking forward to a much brighter side of the, of the tunnel uh, with growth coming back uh, modestly, but we see that going up as well. Um, as in everywhere, I mean, both in developed and, um, and developing economies, and we've seen risk asset drop uh, due to COVID, uh, but also uh, we've uh, also witnessed, uh, particularly in Africa, and as Rob mentioned, uh, a slowdown uh, when it comes to foreign direct investment. Now, these are short-term shocks, uh, and I think the fundamentals remain very strong when it comes to the African uh, investment uh, thesis, and I will be talking a little bit about that as I move on in my presentation. Um, but, um, I mean, we've seen drop in, uh, in foreign direct investments. Now, infrastructure is also, I mean, what COVID has actually uh, opened up is the fact that uh, we need to actually accelerate investment in infrastructure. So, uh, with COVID, I mean, we've seen a huge gap, I mean, moving from what we estimate at the African Development Bank and somewhere around 108 billion US dollars of investment uh, gap, in particular in infrastructure uh, annually, and uh, we've seen that jump to 154 billion just in 2020 alone. Um, also, we've seen as well countries uh, facing fiscal challenges. I mean, not enough aid room to actually respond uh, to the pandemic. And these are things that uh, really uh, have been shaped by, by COVID. And uh, we're looking forward, I mean, particularly when it comes to the African economies that wouldn't be able to actually afford the kind of stimulus we see in the US and maybe in developed economies you are really now going to turn to the private sector to drive growth. And this is really a unique opportunity for, for U.S. investors. Um, I will move on to um, try and um, just, I mean, sort of throw some light on what the challenges are in this market. I think um, this, this is something that I think uh, investors that I speak uh, with across the world uh, who don't, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the investment opportunities in the continent to ask questions on. And yes, we recognize there's a huge uh, information and risk symmetry when it comes to Africa investment opportunities. And this has actually created a problem. It's created a problem of uh, mispricing assets, but it's also created a challenge of um, uh, uh, risk being overweight with more perceived risks than actual risk. And I think one thing with risk is that we need to open up risk and have an objective conversation uh, about risk and really deal with the actual risk than the perceived risk. And what I'm hoping to do with my presentation is to really uncouple that uh, uh, challenge and but also say that when you come to yields in the continent, uh, across the world, African investment opportunities don't provide huge and a higher yield. And I think that's something that any investor will be very uh, keen on. Um, I mean, COVID-induced risk has actually impacted uh, most African economies, and particularly the 
uh, export oriented African economies who are uh, facing a dual challenge of both low uh, commodity prices and also depreciating currencies. And um, also, this uh, basically is crude because of the uh, dependency on trade with China. And I'm hoping that as I move on to maybe unpack some of the figures, that we begin to see a huge jump that our, uh, the U.S. investors can actually tap into to actually bridge the gap between African trade with China with, uh, as compared to African trade uh, with the U.S. Uh, we fully know that the debt of bankable projects and what that speaks to is that we need to actually have a very uh, uh, end-to-end approach to actually creating investment facilitation, but also investment engagement. And that's why I'm very glad with the uh, intervention of apps, and particularly in the projects they've worked on before, in actually bridging this gap. Because what you need in the market, I mean, particularly when it comes to Africa or emerging markets, is really having bankable created opportunities that investors can actually engage in and that these deals can actually be closed. And that requires a very careful uh, methodology in how you approach these opportunities, but how you close the opportunities and how you track the opportunities. Um, I think one, one thing I would actually like to stress, uh, particularly with, when it comes to investors, is that Africa has a very good blend of uh, traditional investors. So when you talk about the DFI uh, network, where, which is where I come from, or you talk about other, I mean, the commercial banks, or, or you talk about... Uh, uh, the, the regular uh, capital providers, um, they're pretty much there. What we try and be hoping to achieve is to really broaden that base and begin to crowd in more institutional investors, so which we call the non-traditional investors. And when you look at this, actually, I mean, uh, uh, when you look at the, the, the pool of capital or the asset under management for global uh, institutional investors, that is expected to double to $145 trillion dollars um, by 2025, and even for Africa, that amounts to about 100. I mean, uh, 1.1 trillion in, by by 2020, and that that is growing. But these funds haven't actually found themselves into uh, African investment opportunities because these projects are not well structured or amenable to the appetite of these investors. And what we are hoping to do is to actually create investment products that can enable institutional investors to invest uh, and crowd a more greater private capital into uh, Africa's uh, investment opportunities. Obviously, this is something to do with the, on the developed markets, and that, that speaks as well to the, the fact that African capital markets, which should really play a very key role in this, is still is at the moment still fragmented and shallow. But we think that this, rather than see this as, an, as, as a challenge, is actually an, an opportunity. And I'm hoping that um, our engagement today can begin to expose some of these uh, for uh, investment survey uh, investors. Now, um, I mean, I've mentioned the whole idea about the challenge with, uh, pu- with, with public finance and management, and this is something that has really created a focus now that Africa has to really tap on private capital to actually grow and recover from the pandemic. But beyond that, I think what we've seen globally is that we cannot solely rely on the global supply chains. And so a lot of the manufacturing, a lot of um, the value chain uh, will need to be domesticated in order to enable Africa actually respond uh, to, uh, to, to not just this shock, but even uh, future uh, shocks that would come through. And what that means is huge investment opportunity in building infrastructure, but also building the connecting uh, uh, infrastructure and trade that can drive that resilience. I would then move, I mean, so pretty much touch on now, on what are these investment and trade opportunities that we see? I mentioned the whole idea of the infrastructure gap. Now, that presents pretty much almost uh, about a $100 billion, 90 to $100 billion investment opportunity yearly uh, in Africa. And this is pretty much across both critical and productive, or what you call social and economic infrastructure, so, um, uh, which have very strong fundamentals. Um, the CFTA, as uh, mentioned by, my, uh, by Rob, is a huge and incredible opportunity. I mean, this is one time where Africa, the whole 54 countries, have come together to set up a single market and um, hoping to, I mean, driving uh, liberalizing uh, uh, trade barriers uh, almost 90% by 2034. That's a huge ambition. But when you look at trade, particularly uh, uh, between the U.S. and Africa, that hasn't really done much. I mean, when you you look at the five destinations of trade uh, uh, from Africa, 
uh, you have that going to both uh, uh, Asia and uh, and, the, and Europe, and uh, China is on top with about 60 billion, and the U.S. is somewhere on the uh, fourth place with about uh, uh, 28.7 uh, uh, billion. Now that needs to be reversed because there's so much being done by the USA. I mean, I work very closely with them in several transactions, and I will provide an example of that. And there's no reason why the U.S. Uh, cannot increase that number, it will even surpass the number, uh, the trade figures between uh, Africa and, uh, and, and China. And I think my speaking on this is really to open up this as a conversation as we move forward, as seeing what we can do collectively to actually improve these numbers. Now, Africa has a huge and vibrant ecosystem. I mean, when you talk about fintech, as mentioned by Rob, I mean, just last year, uh, even within the pandemic, we saw uh, 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 the, um, we saw uh, uh, a, a U.S. Uh, a company in Stripe payment system actually bought uh, uh, Paystack for 200 million or acquired Paystack. So, and these things are happening. I mean, uh, just last year alone, even within the pandemic, African startups raised about two billion. I mean, across 234 deals. So, um, there's a lot of activity here and a huge opportunity. And given the demographic uh, dividend of the continent, a lot of uh, about 77% of um, the population of Africa is still youth. So there's a huge and incredible opportunity here. But beyond that, if you look at the consumer spending, I mean, just um, by 2025, you're actually looking at a consumer spending market of about $2.1 trillion. So these are not just numbers. So if you're thinking about investment, if you're thinking about trade, then Africa is really the place you want to be. Um, SME as well, I mean, as in everywhere, I mean, uh, globally, are really the ones that will drive growth. I mean, the recovery uh, from the pandemic is really going to be driven by SMEs. And when you look at Africa, there, there is a financing gap on SMEs, uh, totaling about 70% of the GDP of the continent. So um, Rob actually mentioned the whole drive to, uh, to, to digital. I mean, and I think this is something uh, that we all experience globally. So there's a unique uh, thesis here for how you look at Africa, uh, as not just a destination, for, for grant, for the destination for investment. And I think it's that investment conversation that I would like us to really focus on. My next slide will uh, really uh, talk on what the roadmaps are so, uh, for, for investors. To really be uh, uh, a game changer for this market, right partnerships are critical. Uh, they are critical in terms of actually creating investment opportunities, but they're critical in terms of actually engaging on those opportunities and closing those opportunities. And I think um, the experience of apps has been very, very important here in terms of uh, the significant progress that we made across the different regions, uh, not just in Africa, but even in Asia. But I will speak of one example where um, the U.S. has played a critical role, even in 2020, in fostering investment and closing those investments. Uh, we, at the, uh, in, in, at the African Development Bank, we're looking at a vaccine project in Kenya, uh, given the pandemic. I mean, Kenya as a country is, is graduating from Gavi, and we had set up this project uh, during the pandemic uh, and repurposed the facility to actually produce COVID when the vaccines get produced. Now, guess what? Uh, to actually de-risk that investment and get that investment to market, it was actually uh, the USA through the USTDA uh, funding that is hoping to actually create the bankable documents that will allow for investors to actually close on the transaction and get this vaccine facility up on speed, providing critical support during the pandemic across not just uh, 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 Kenya, but even the West African region. Um, I also, I mean, when it comes to the African market, there's a huge opportunity in deepening the financial market. And also, a long-term view is absolutely critical. Uh, it is critical when you're looking at uh, uh, coming into the market because the investment fundamentals are there. I mean, I just mentioned the figures. I mean, when you look uh, and, and, and a few years down the line, I mean, these fundamentals are strong. So you really want to get into this market now. So I'll stop here, and I hope um, we'll be able to have a very engaging conversation. And I want to thank um, uh, uh, Apps for organizing this forum, and I look forward to uh, being able to engage with you. Thank you very much. So I'll pass, um, maybe have Paloma come on as well. Paloma, over to you. Great. Thank you, Ezekiel. Um, thanks a lot. It's, it's really great to be here. Uh, one of our earliest partnerships 
uh, when we founded Ethical Apparel Africa about five years ago now was actually with Apt Associates um, and their capacity running the West Africa Trade and Investment Hub. So it's very cir full circle for me uh, to be here today reflecting on the journey we've taken since that point. Before I go into talking more about EAA and uh, what that journey has been, I want to zoom out for a moment and talk about the garment industry as a whole. What's really striking about this industry is the employment creation potential. Um, it's a $500 billion plus market, and it employs 60 million people globally, 70% of whom are women. So it's arguably the largest formal employer of women globally in terms of sectors. What is also really striking about this industry is how quickly growth can happen in emerging economies. Um, it's very well known as uh, a sector that can drive the first steps of industrialization and can pivot an economy towards being export oriented. We have a lot of examples of that happening over the past 20, 30 years. Bangladesh is obviously very well known. A more recent example is Myanmar, where they have actually grown their industry to over 3 billion in exports in a fairly short amount of time. In about five years, most of that growth has happened. And that industry is now employing over a million people in Myanmar, which is 1 50th of their population. The overall population is 50 million. So that's a very exciting ratio if we think about the potential of this industry to grow in new hubs uh, in Africa. Overall, the, uh, China is still very much dominating exports in this industry. Over 100 billion of that 500 billion market uh, is coming from China. But there is a growing trend of interest and growth, uh, particularly among US buyers, to shift production to Sub-Saharan Africa. The big draw, of course, is AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act. Um, that's an up to 30% advantage for this sector. And that's on top of really fundamental cost competitiveness and longevity of cost competitiveness as efficiency of manufacturing operations improve across the continent. So it's a very exciting opportunity. It's a sector that um, maybe holds a little bit less um, kind of instant innovation appeal versus something like tech, but it's a sector that has a lot of opportunity to create equitable employment for people and primarily for women who otherwise may be left behind uh, as economies develop. When we started EAA five years ago, uh, we, we really took a strategic look at the continent and where we wanted to base operations. Most of the attention so far for this industry in Sub-Saharan Africa has been in East Africa and countries like Ethiopia and Kenya. Um, and we actually took a differ on that and decided to set up in Ghana. And we also have a small uh, satellite operation in Benin. We did that because we see that West Africa offers all of the same opportunities as East Africa does, the duty-free access, cost competitiveness, but it also offers proximity to market. Um, so we have a real advantage in West Africa in terms of the proximity to EU markets and to the East Coast of the US, most importantly. I'm going to give just a brief overview of EAA now uh, before starting to talk more about investment and partnerships. Um, as I mentioned, we were founded five years ago. We started as a sourcing company. Um, so coming to Ghana, seeing that there were locally owned factories that had the ambition and the potential to export, but needed support in order to make that leap. Um, so we provide technical capacity building assistance to factories in our capacity as a sourcing agent. And then we bring export orders that are high volume and consistent so that they can um, sequentially get better and better on the efficiency of those orders, which enables them to scale. We have a team of about 25 experts um, from around the world with deep experience in garment manufacturing operations who are in those factories on a daily basis, making improvements in quality and efficiency. For us, though, in terms of the purpose of our company and, and why we got into this in the first place, myself and my co-founder, Karen, um, it, it's really about more than just building garment operations. That's our day-to-day. -day. But for us, the purpose is the impact on people and the job creation potential for women in particular. Uh, we hold a belief, which really shouldn't be controversial, that investing in people is good for business. 
Um, you can see our kind of flywheel operating model there on the right hand side of the slide. Um, and we see, and we're already seeing this in our current operations, that as you invest in people in ways that make sense for particular factories, that that yields dividends and um, that that yields advantages in terms of lower turnover, lower absenteeism, better loyalty, better productivity at the factory level. So that's our operating model and that's our thesis as a business. Over the past couple of years, uh, we've seen huge growth in demand. Um, frankly, the first few years uh, when we started the business in 2015 were very difficult in terms of getting brands to take a risk and take a bet on uh, Ghana as a new sourcing and, and manufacturing destination that was completely unknown. But as we have built trusting relationships with our clients, with our brand partners, the, the interest in the value proposition that West Africa apparel manufacturing provides has really skyrocketed, which has been fantastic to see. Uh, we're primarily producing uniforms. Um, we do a lot of medical scrubs and then we have an accessories business as well. As demand from our clients has grown, what that meant for us um, is that we needed to scale capacity more quickly. We saw that the pace that the local factory partners we work with were growing at was not going to be sufficient to supply the level of capacity that our buyers were looking for. So we decided that we needed to take the steps to strategically invest ourselves in owned manufacturing, which is what we have done. Um, our first such investment um, is a factory a couple of hours outside of the capital city of Accra that we are developing into a model factory. Um, so both Rob and Ezekiel mentioned digital. That's a huge focus for us um, in terms of designing a custom ERP system, leveraging digital product development technology. We're also very focused on uh, lean operational principles and really just embedding best practices from the very beginning in our factory system. And a lot of these, most of these um, improvements um, and, and efforts towards this model factory reality have been made possible by our U.S. investor base. Um, so U.S. investors have funded this project, our investment into this factory. We also have recently confirmed um, a co-investment matching grant from the USAID Trade Hub. This is a $1.3 million grant. Uh, which has been huge in de-risking the investment opportunity for our U.S. investors. And now that this is um, developing and, and we're already at a level of 500 jobs created in this facility with a goal to create 1,000 over the next couple of years in total, uh, for us, the next few years are about scale and about replication. So this year we're exporting about 8 million. Um, we have a very clear roadmap to achieve over $50 million in exports by 2025, and that will allow us to grow to about 5,000 jobs created overall. I want to step back for a sec and talk a little bit about, about our keys to growth and resilience over the past couple of years. So why is it that uh, through COVID we've been able to be resilient um, and actually our, our orders through the pandemic have grown by over 2x, uh, which is really a testament to the levels of trust, transparency, and long-term strategic alignment that we have with our clients. Of course, we've also been fortunate to be in business verticals like medical scrubs, so there's a certain amount of luck in that. But I think this is a theme that's going coming up again and again through this discussion. The, the level of alignment in partnership, depth in partnership, um, and frankly, trust um, is just something that I think will become more and more important um, as, as businesses grow and as they face new shocks and need to be increasingly resilient. Another thing um, that we've really focused on through the COVID period um, is something Ezekiel touched on. Um, in terms of opportunities to drive value in the regional supply chain given new demand areas. So we are soon standing up, um, to our knowledge, the region's first surgical mask production unit to international standard. Um, so this is, we've had a lot of support from the American National Standards Institute, and this is actually going to produce masks that are meeting all U.S. Uh, and EU standards for use in medical environments. Uh, we're very excited about that, not only in terms of the market opportunity, but also in terms of the contribution to supply chain resilience in the region. 
And the last key to resilience I wanna to touch on is the drive to go beyond um, self-interest as a business. Um, so yes, our day-to-day -day is about growing our own manufacturing operations, but we're also very focused on taking a broader view to advance the industry as a whole. Um, so we're working with the public, within the public ecosystem alongside development agencies um, to advance the, the full industry. Uh, one example is a recent project we've launched as a public-private partnership uh, with GIZ um, to stand up a $2 million center of excellence to train local middle managers in technical skill areas and with a focus on digital technology, so creating the pipeline of talent for the industry in the future. Another really exciting area for us is the potential to integrate the cotton value chain in West Africa. It's one of the largest uh, cotton producing regions in the world, um, sixth largest in fact, but the vast majority of the cotton is exported raw. There's a real opportunity to close that gap in the value chain so that the region not only becomes one of the most cost competitive hubs uh, for apparel manufacturing, but also one of the fastest in the world. I want to close um, just by reflecting for a second on, on impact. So again, we, are, uh, we started this business in order to have an impact on people. Um, we're proud of what we've achieved so far with the thousand jobs that have been created across our network. And we're really looking forward to the scale that we are planning to achieve in the coming years um, as the industry continues to grow. So that's it from me. I'm going to pass over to Wilson. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Paloma. Uh, thank you, Eric and Rob, who introduced us earlier. And of course, thank you, everyone who is attending. Uh, my name is Wilson Kutegeka, uh, the founder and CEO at Clink Mass International. We are a company responsible for development and uh, support of Clink Master, our product that I'm going to share with you in the next uh, slide. Um, Clinic Master essentially is a healthcare information management and medical billing system that is capable of automating patients' records in a healthcare facility for visits and daily procedures. Our Clinic Master International was incorporated in 2013 in Uganda, but before that, as a product, we had started operations two years earlier. Currently, we have a team of 18 full-time software engineers, computer scientists, and other professionals working full-time uh, for Clinic Master International. Uh, the product is used by over 120 hospitals and clinics in Uganda, Kenya, South Sudan, Rwanda, and Zambia, but majority are actually in, in Uganda. Clinic Master as a product, we've also received a couple of awards more recently, uh, the MTN Uganda Best Innovation in Health Application Award that uh, we received in 2015. Yeah, and of course, we've not done this by ourselves. Uh, a couple of partners have helped us to achieve this. One is the Netherlands Trust Fund that is implemented by the International Trade Center that provides us with assistance to grow our export market. And actually the introduction uh, of Clinic Master to LBT Associates was done by the International Trade Center and a couple of other partners as you can see. COVID-19 impact. Yes, like most businesses, uh, we've also felt the pandemic impact. Uh, earlier, especially last year, earlier last year, almost to, to, toward the middle of the year, 
we had to scale down our ability to reach potential clients. So we will not sell more, especially due to the fact that potential clients require us to visit their facility, uh, carry if it's built a study, and then do demo. So our movement was limited, and that's why our uh, ability to reach potential clients slowed down. And uh, provision of support was also limited, especially for the current clients using Clinic Master. We would not easily travel uh, to be able to provide real-time support to users for them to continue using the system. But of course, uh, we've also seen advantages coming out of this or lessons. We learned a few lessons, positive lessons, may call. And we quickly realized that it's actually cost effective on our site to use more online support tools to be able to do demo and uh, and uh, demo and also provide support. So we are quickly transitioning from the traditional visiting of client premises to offer support and uh, uh, demonstrate for a sale to using more and more of online tools, Zoom, uh, uh, WebEx, uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. Be able to provide our services. Uh, we've also added additional modules in our system, uh, uh, such as uh, COVID-19 symptoms checker and remote treatment functionality, which uh, obviously will enhance our product value of our product, and thereafter uh, we get better uh, usage or better uptake of our system. Our experience and the exporting challenges uh, are up to date. Our external customers have been reaching us through our website. We still do not have physical presence in most of these other countries. Uh, however, uh, the Netherlands Trust Fund, implemented by ITC, has actually helped us to complete our export marketing plan, our export marketing plan that uh, we are currently implementing, uh, whereby we uh, realize that we, we are better off dealing with agents in these different countries than actually wanting to open our own offices in the same, uh, uh, in, in different places. Uh, uh, also, because of our not being so present in external market, our market hasn't grown as expected uh, yet, but we are working on that. Uh, just also like for our local market, we've had difficulty in providing support due to limited physical visits. Uh, but also through different partners and engagement, we plan to migrate our product to the cloud so that we can reach many more uh, potential clients than we currently serve. And uh, through our uh, interaction with the International Trade Center and different uh, workshops and the conferences we've attended, we happened to uh, get in touch with uh, Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, specifically uh, to Dr. Michael Marin of New York-based Mount Sinai Econ School of Medicine, who was looking to opening surgical centers in Africa. And particularly, he was looking at beginning with Uganda and also Senegal. And uh, uh, while Dr. Marine was doing planning to open the surgical center and through a technology partner, Telistic, that is also based in the uh, in USA, and uh, the interaction of different conferences, uh, we got in touch and he came to learn about Clinic Master and uh, chose to adopt Clinic Master to manage medical records. Uh, currently, uh, Chiabiwa Surgical Center in Uganda, which is also affiliated with Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, uses Clinic Master. And also through that uh, uh, interaction, uh, our 
product has also been enhanced to include a web-based module for key reports, especially to uh, the team in, in New York. So on, on top of uh, installing at Chavirua, we are also working on various changes to be able to uh, provide real-time reports for the managers uh, in New York. And uh, yes, uh, that uh, is what I have to share. Thank you. I'll pass over the uh, ball to uh, Pamela, the next presenter. Thank you. Good morning. I want to thank Apt Associates for the opportunity to speak with you today. I'm looking forward to sharing some information about the tools that companies can use to mitigate or to de-risk financial transactions uh, internationally through trade credit and political risk insurance. But first, a little bit about me. As you heard, I worked for the State Department covering trade and economic issues. And then I moved on to work for a specialty insurance brokerage, Securitas Global Risk Solutions, which works with private carriers as well as the U.S. Export-Import Bank to develop commercial risk mitigation solutions. Next slide, please. In the first part of my career, back in the day at the Department of State, we dealt with lots of facts and figures about international trade. But before your eyes glaze over, we summarized international trade policy with three little words. Trade is good. Trade is good because it provides broader and deeper markets for any product that your company might be selling. But it also provides broader and deeper access to the types of inputs, inputs of both goods and services that your company may need to make a great product which your company in turn can sell into the global marketplace. So instead of thinking of trade as a zero sum transaction, a simple two way exchange, some people have begun to refer to engaging in trade as joining the global value chain. In the global value chain, each business entity has the opportunity to add value by specializing in the good or service where it excels, contributing that good or service to other products or services. Next slide, please. Well, that's all well and good from a theoretical perspective, but if you are in business and thinking about exporting, trade can also be risky. In practice, there are some unique risks associated with buying from or selling to business entities that your company has not worked with previously. And the biggest risk there is your company's invoices may not get paid. But fortunately, within the insurance industry, there are tools available that can help mitigate these risks and help company owners sleep better at night. These risk mitigation solutions help to companies to grow in a way that protects revenue. That brings me to the first tool, trade credit insurance. There are several benefits of trade credit insurance, but today I'm going to talk about just two. The first, as I mentioned, is that trade credit insurance protects a company from the risk of commercial non-payment. If a client fails to pay, if the client goes bankrupt or pays slowly, having trade credit insurance in place will help to protect the seller from unexpected non-payment. Next slide, please. As an example of how trade credit insurance benefits both buyers and sellers, I wanted to talk about one of our clients. This client sells an organic, non-toxic biostimulant product, which enhances soil quality as well as irrigation efficiency. It's currently undergoing testing in several countries on the African continent. By improving the impact of fertilizer and by increasing the efficient use of water, this product reduces the financial costs associated with agricultural production. However, by growing crops more efficiently, it also helps to reduce the environmental impact of commercial agriculture. This U.S. company knew that their product would support the effort to increase world food production in an organic and sustainable way. They wanted to export, but they also wanted to mitigate the risk of commercial non-payment for international transactions. By ensuring their invoices or their accounts receivable, they were able to expand their international sales to new markets and whole new regions. And this brings me to the second benefit of trade credit insurance that I wanted to talk about today. With trade credit insurance, this company was also able to provide their international buyers with better payment terms 
giving them 30 to 60 days to pay invoices instead of having the buyer pay cash up front. The product, in turn, will help to lead to higher crop yields with lower fertilizer inputs and less irrigation, allowing farmers to obtain higher yields at lower costs, both financially and to the environment. In particular, the product will help to increase the yields of crops grown both for domestic consumption and for international export. All of this is facilitated because the company was able to enter international markets without putting revenues at risk. Next slide, please. Next, I wanted to turn to political risk insurance. In my company's experience, once a trade relationship has been built, international investments often follow. An exporter may need to have a satellite office or a center or a processing facility in the new country where their product is sold. I'd like to note that many countries welcome international investors for the same reasons that they welcome trade. International investors can help expand the range of goods and services available in the country and provide access to international know-how and skills. But on a political level, protectionist policies can sometimes enjoy a certain appeal. The investment rules can change over time. At its most extreme, a change in government policy can put the international investment at risk of confiscation, expropriation, or nationalization. Here again, our company helps to develop solutions to protect international investments with political risk insurance. As an example of what can happen, I'll turn to the Western Hemisphere. Uh, a few years ago, Mexico had opened part of its natural resources industry to international investors. This permitted that country to get better access to advanced technology and service techniques that had not been available domestically. From a legal and political perspective, laws and attitudes appeared to have changed from the past. International investors in that industry were being welcomed. But unfortunately, the welcome didn't last very long. According to news reports, what now appears to be happening in practice is what's called a slow rolling expropriation. This involves making what had been a profitable business investment unprofitable. In this case, the government appears to be using bureaucratic means to hinder business operations. Permits are issued slowly or not at all. Terms of the permits have changed and some offices have been closed for minor infractions. In, and these were, are infractions that in the recent past would have just been handled as a simple correction. Once again, though, there's an insurance solution to help protect assets and investments from unexpected policy or currency changes. It's called political risk insurance, and it covers a variety of risks that international investors face. Expropriation, nationalization, currency risk, political violence, or other forms of civil strife. On the insurance itself, both for trade credit and political risk, pricing is dependent on the level of risk involved something that insurance carriers measure and watch closely. But this type of insurance is often pennies on the dollar to protect both international revenues and investments. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, international trade and investment can be a rising tide that lifts all ships. It helps to build trust and build relationships internationally, as some of my colleagues have mentioned here this morning. It provides new opportunities for new markets and even to build new products with internationally available inputs. It allows companies to join the global value chain. Companies have a way to mitigate the risk associated with international transactions and investment with trade credit and political risk insurance. And for trade credit and political risk insurance needs, I do encourage you to contact Securitas Global Risk Solutions. Thanks very much. Great, Pamela, thanks a lot for that. And thanks to Ezekiel Coloma uh, and Wilson also for the uh, thought provoking, but I think also very concrete presentation. So we really get a sense already of the kinds of things uh, that characterize good investments, you know, good trade transactions, the kinds of opportunities and challenges that exist in the market. And also from Pamela, some of the things we can do to, uh, let's say, de risk, reduce risk, manage risk. So uh, I think I want to jump right into some of the questions we've seen already from participants, and we appreciate you giving the questions and keep them coming. One of the things I mentioned in my opening was about this new emphasis on resilience of uh, supply chains. So deals can happen, but people are more interested in our ability to manage and mitigate 
uh, risk related to potential disruptions. So we had a question which I'm going to, I'm going to direct first to Paloma, but then I want to come back to a couple of others on that. So Paloma, the question was to you, how have you been able to build a resilient supply chain uh, coming out of West Africa? What have been some of the challenges and how have you, how have you made that supply chain resilient? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think part of what I noticed in the chat as well is someone was talking about the raw material element of that supply chain, which is a very relevant question, given that most cotton uh, in West Africa is exported raw. Where are we getting our raw material from and what are the possible risks associated with that? Um, one of the things we've done is just source very widely from a global standpoint. From a cost perspective, bringing in containers, as long as it's done efficiently, and with proper planning, bringing in containers of raw material from mostly Asian countries, China, India, we have some raw material also coming from Turkey, a little bit from South Africa. Um, it doesn't add enough cost to mitigate our overall cost competitiveness. It's very minor in the scheme of the garment costing. Um, the, the big factor is really controlling risk. And for that, we have um, invested in sourcing expertise on our team to be able to offer our clients a wide variety of raw material sources coming from different areas um, in the world. This was very relevant in early COVID times when China was the most impacted and we had a lot of our raw material suppliers um, shutting down and having um, really uncertain time horizons in terms of when they would be able to reopen. Um, we already had a certain degree of risk mitigation built in in terms of alternatives, but it really hit home for us the need to not only think about risks from a COVID health, from a just general business continuity risk perspective for our core manufacturing operations in Ghana, but also thinking about the wider supply chain and making sure that we're protected um, on that front as well. So it's really building in the ability to, to anticipate and manage some of these risks. And you saw it paying yeah. off in a massive shock. Yes, and having global alternatives uh, with strong relationships with suppliers in different areas of the world. So I want to direct the same question to Ezekiel, but maybe more broadly. So Ezekiel, in, the, in, in your discussion with investors and looking at deals, do you see this growing emphasis on resilience? And how are you thinking about structuring that into transactions? Uh, from the supply chain perspective, am I muted? Can you know? We can hear you. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, um, it's, it's in addition to the supply chain uh, mitigation of risk, it's also even on the financing side. So, um, there are uh, guarantee solutions, particularly on the financing of the infrastructure, uh, that can actually de risk the, 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 that infrastructure and make it uh, easier for companies to be able to. Um, either uh, mobilize investment, but also um, be able to uh, service what you call debt service, uh, provide, uh, I mean, pay back um, the, uh, the loan uh, they've mobilized. So it is looking at risk from an end-to-end -end, uh, process. And I think um, what we have done, I mean, uh, from the African Development Bank is to look at each project uniquely and be able to de-risk uh, those transactions in ensuring that the uh, private sector entity does have the most competitive financing to grow, but also that we pay attention to what uh, Paloma has mentioned in terms of how is the supply chain resilient? Can we actually domesticate elements of that supply chain? And I think with COVID, that has actually exacerbated and brought that consideration to the, uh, to, uh, to the fore. Thanks. Let me ask a quick uh, follow-up that Georgia just asked. Is there a way so that she's talking about gaps um, in, in local financing, is there a way to build better partnerships between the investors, banks, and uh, insurance in order to you know, to make that suite work better? Absolutely. I mean, the, um, there are multilateral agencies that do provide very good uh, risk mitigation, uh, they, and, and I think in line with what uh, Pamela was saying. So um, uh, we have MIGA, we have the African Development Bank, um, African Trade Assurance, which is really dealing on the trade side, afri ASEAN Bank, that is with uh, really much on trade. Um, I'm really just focused, I mean, uh, highlighting those in the continent. Then you have MIGA as well. MIGA has a huge operation in the continent, and they also provide mitigating solutions uh, when it comes to um, whether you, you're talking about um, a political risk insurance, but also uh, insurance that backstop 
transactions or partial risk insurance or partial credit insurance that are able to backstop obligations that maybe uh, the government may have if it's a PPP transaction or, or that a company may be uh, liable to if it's actually servicing its debt with its, uh, with its lenders. So there is a whole uh, range of solutions that are available. And I think the sweet spot is really structuring a web bankable and uh, web structured transactions that allow uh, competitive financing uh, to come into uh, an entity and to grow that entity. What I would say is in Africa is that if you have a well structured project, the financing is there to back it up. And I think um, we also, I mean, the, 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 the risking solutions are also there to back it up as well. Thanks, Ezekiel. So, Pamela, this all sounds easy. Uh, just click a button and you got all, all you need and bang, you've got, uh, you've got a transaction. So, to, can you confirm all this is easy and it works just like that, or uh, wh why, why are we not? Why is it not uh, in some ways easier? Um, I actually think you know there's a process to go through to obtain the insurance, and and in the course of that process, without getting into too much detail, uh, it allows the seller to get better credit information on their buyers. Um, that's part of developing the insurance policy that's part of assessing the risk associated with that kind of insurance policy. But what it also does is it allows that risk to be managed by a well-capitalized uh, insurance carrier. So it, there's a, a step involved uh, to get the insurance, but it, it is not, um, it's not that complicated. It's, it's a, just a process like anything where you apply for the insurance. Uh, what the benefits of a brokerage does is it allows you to uh, use the knowledge of the brokerage to shop competitively and find a product that covers the types of risks that you need to cover in a transaction uh, and get the best pricing on it. So there are, there are, it's a competitive market. There are uh, private carriers as well as MIGA, the World Bank, uh, as well as in, uh, US, U.S. Export Import Bank. So there are a variety of different options that cover different situations. Um, and for the seller, that allows you to get better uh, access to better credit information because these carriers all are watching a variety of factors that give signals about uh, the, the credit worthiness of a buyer. Um, back to the capital question a little bit, and this is getting a little bit deeper into what this insurance does. Um, it allows companies to uh, transact and have access to credit in a way that does not tie up working capital. So that is a big benefit, particularly for countries uh, in in a situation where um, working capital is uh, is precious. This product allows companies to to buy and sell um, without tying up working capital in a letter of credit, things along those lines. Great. And uh, George also in the chat pointed out that the transparency you've mentioned, I've mentioned, I think Ezekiel mentioned, this is something right. I think practitioners like us can really help do is create this transparency, yeah. which we do, which which increases the level of comfort that an investor right. or a buyer can have. Right. So, so um, Wilson, I want to bring you in here for a slightly different uh, question. So my question to you is uh, along the lines of the, the issue of coordinating assistance. So we hear about insurance, we hear about help from uh, developed level development banks, ITC has worked with you, uh, at Wilson, we've got Aft Associates, we've got a lot of different uh, folks who can help and Prosper Africa, the US government's got tons of different resources. So you've worked with different providers, what's the challenge in coordinating and how would you, how would you recommend we coordinate ourselves better? Yeah, um, thank you uh, very much, uh, Robert. Yeah, sure, we, we, we've worked with uh, different partners and largely in terms of uh, providing uh, soft skills, uh, very importantly, have standards, like maybe we, we became uh, ISO uh, uh, certified, ISO 2009, 900 certified on quality, 
uh, uh, received uh, uh, you know uh, training in terms of export and strategy and generally uh, put together internal systems and that has been uh, a big factor uh, from partners and on top of that uh, we say there is the introductory part and uh, especially when you are uh, uh, dealing with uh, also another international company, yeah, there, there is that. Uh, usually, companies want to feel comfortable of who they are dealing with, and when you have a common partner, it becomes easier uh, uh, to relate. So, I I, I would say like uh, the different generally different partners sometimes may provide uh, the same field, but w w what is important. What is very important and, and, and critical is to understand that different markets or different environments behave differently. So when we are looking for intervention, so it's usually very important that it is tailored towards the local requirements or the local needs. So it, it, it is something that I would strongly advocate to partners to pay attention to and understand the dynamics locally and be able to adjust. Like, for example, you could find the, the market in Europe might be at a certain level, and the market in Africa, as an example, is also at a certain level, at a certain standard. Perhaps, uh, if, for example, assuming the very standard that applies in USA, as an example, America, sorry, America or Europe, you immediately come to implement in Africa, it may not give you immediate results. So you need to understand that sort of uh, might be uh, scaled down or adjust uh, to be able to uh, have an impact. Yeah, that, that, that's what I can say uh, right now. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and, it's, and I think you made a good point. You can understand what the different service providers do and, and, and work with them for, for what they can do well and work with others, and also that the solutions be tailored. I think those are two big takeaways from what you said. I wanted to bring Paloma in here as well. Paloma, you've worked with APT, the USA, uh, and at other service providers. What was your experience, and how would you say these kinds of assistance can be better coordinated, or were there gaps? Yeah, I think um – having experience of working with USAID and then the DFID, um, the UK and, and German equivalent DFID, which is now the FCDO and GIZ, um, it's been really interesting understanding the different mechanisms and priorities of these different actors for this sector. Um, I think one of the things that we've gotten better at collectively is um, pushing for closer coordination um, there can be different priorities for very good reasons, but that can also mean an overlap of efforts or efforts that aren't perfectly coordinated in terms of work being done once to set criteria for one entity and then being done another time for another entity. We viewed our role as um, a public sector player, and I'm talking about our NGO side now, working with all three of these agencies um, as trying to help coordinate and bring together these efforts. Um, so I think that that's a major learning just in terms of those conversations happening more frequently and more organically. And in a way, you had to coordinate us. Would you say that's, that's kind of how it worked out? Or would you say that uh, the different service providers found each other and were able to complement? I think we – I'm it's – hard to say what was the driver of what, um, but we got there. <laughs> Whether it was us, you know, suggesting that we have these conversations or them seeing that others were active in the same space, um, yeah, it happened ultimately. Yeah, I think it's, uh, and, I, and I ask it kind of provocatively, but I think it's a really good point that also uh, the company sometimes, you know, have to advocate for that and bring folks yeah. together. And I think for my own work as a practitioner, I know we need to also put real energy into thinking about how uh, these different programs uh, fit together and to try not, you know, we often are on different cycles, we have different money, we have different focuses, we have different markets, we have different templates, different exactly. logos, uh, we use different uh, conferencing platforms and so on. So, yeah. um, and that's something that, 
you know, I think is what we're aware of, but 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 are trying to to find to find ways to to continue to do better. And I think a lot of the funders are also thinking in those terms. I had one more question for you, Paloma, that came from the chat. This was specifically on uh, did you have issues of managing infrastructure? So power uh, and and those kinds of things. And if you did, how did you how did you manage? Yeah, um, we. Ghana for the last several years has been more consistent on power than it was for the years prior to that. Um, Dumsor, as they say in Ghana, was a huge issue when we first started operations, but that has really improved. We do, of course, still have generators at each of the factories um, and are working actively on moving towards solar as a better backup option, solar with batteries, um, financed over time. Um, so, yeah, from a power point of view, it hasn't been a major point, pain point, but it's something where we would like to move toward renewables um, rather than generators. Um, someone also asked about ports in the chat, I think. Um, so just very briefly, the, the size of the port and the efficiency in terms of flexibility of different transshipment routes for the port was definitely part of our calculus in setting up in Ghana, um, but it's still – definitely not perfect. Clearing costs in Ghana are very high. So I'm just talking about the cost of taking a container from the ship at the port and getting it to our factory. Um, that cost is about five to 10 times higher than traditional garment manufacturing hubs. It's about $1,500 versus a couple hundred dollars in Mauritius and Sri Lanka and other places. Um, so there are still kinks to be worked out there, but the, the fact that the port is um, very functional, one of the largest in Sub-Saharan Africa was certainly part of our, our calculus in setting up in Ghana. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I want to bring Ezekiel in here. We have a question about how can the private sector in Africa come together uh, and, you know, uh, and, and advance their interests and in, in a way influence the ecosystem to be more favorable to uh, you know, to these kinds of transactions. So what, what uh, has been in your, your experience at the ADB, Ezekiel, in, in bringing the private sector together? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for that. I think the private sector in Africa actually now demanding more. I think um, they're becoming a bit more sophisticated. And so uh, in terms of having and assessing and asking the right questions when it comes to financing options, uh, innovative financing, so it's, um, I mean, you talk about blended finance and having in a way uh, how you you can uh, both uh, look at both uh, currency financing between hard currency and local currency, so local resource mobilization. So these are conversations that you hardly hear, I mean, uh, a few years ago, but um, they're beginning to pop up, I think, uh, because um, uh, the private sector to uh, realize that uh, a government does work and not do a lot of uh, fix all of the uh, problems. I mean, the, the the infrastructure need, the uh, the growth need for the continent is going to be driven by private sector. So um, and also the 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 you having also a more sophisticated uh, joint venture formation. So with uh, companies from overseas, I mean, uh, leveraging uh, companies with local knowledge and local capacity. Um, you see more of that happening as well. I mean, bringing capabilities and also uh, uh, creating opportunities. And I think I want to stress on on the fact that um, when it comes to um, how uh, companies do exploit opportunities in the in the market, um, they are beginning to demand uh, a, a more better enabling environment, even on the side of government. So we're seeing government action begin to respond uh, to favorably to um, to private sector concerns, we are not all there yet, but we, we, I think the government as well is beginning to realize that um, they can do it all by themselves. I mean, how can you cover 19 billion plus uh, financing gap? It's not going to happen from the public sector. The ODA financing is also drying up or stagnating, uh, so uh, the private sector is key, and I think uh, this is really one of the, the drivers. When we did the African Investment Forum uh, in 2018. I mean, no one actually could say that you have bankable or projects in Africa, but we're able to mobilize uh, close to about uh, 48.6 billion dollars of investment opportunity that went to the boardrooms, and those investment opportunities have been being, being closed as we speak. I think over 3.5 billion has already closed within a year. 
So that's the scale. And I think um, these are all coming from private sector uh, financing who are taking advantage of opportunities. And that's why coordination is critical. I think coordination is one area that uh, you really need uh, to be able to handhold investors who are new in the continent and be able to drive them through the whole investment process. Absolutely. And I, I, I want to come back to you on the issue of coordination um, because somebody's asked a question about the diaspora. So can you really quickly say, do you see the diaspora taking a role in this? And then I'm going to come to Pamela on what should the private sector be asking for in terms of policy. But Ezekiel, what have you seen from the diaspora? Absolutely. I think this is the exciting time to be in the continent or to do business in the continent. And I think um, the diaspora present a unique opportunity for for Africa to be able to advance. I mean, bringing knowledge, capability, and also uh, uh, combining that with local capacity to be able to put uh, projects, bank projects together that can deliver uh, returns. I mean, um, there's been pretty much a reverse, I mean, not uh, fully there, uh, but we've seen uh, in diaspora uh, uh, capabilities coming back into the continent to exploit opportunities. And we want to welcome all of this. I think um, the gains of that uh, interaction is absolutely critical uh, for the recovery of the continent uh, from the pandemic, but even more so uh, for the growth that we uh, would want to see. So, but what we are actually saying in this uh, 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 um, summit or rather uh, uh, engagement is that you have all the parameters to enable you to succeed. So if you have a good idea, you have the bankable transactions, you will succeed in the continent. I mean, we have a, a telemedicine project that came from the UK uh, that has won many global awards, uh, Mobi Health, uh, that is providing telemedicine for the first time in Nigeria and a few other countries. So um, there is always an opportunity for African diaspora to to take advantage of uh, the opportunities in the continent. That telemedicine is fantastic. It brings in a lot of the elements I've talked about, which is underserved, which is digital, which is inclusive, um, and and uh, also services. So that's uh, that that's the kind of thing that really you know gets us interesting interested. So uh, Pamela, quickly over to you on you were talking about what should the, the private sector is coming together a bit more in Africa. What are the kinds of things that uh, they are advocating for or they should be advocating for and how do we support them? Right. I think the most critical piece for investors in any country is certainty. Investors want certainty about the rules. They want certainty and transparency on the rules. They want to know that it's a rule of law based, uh, you know, environment and that things are not going to change at the whim of, you know, a, a change in, um, that there isn't going to be a major policy change in direction uh, if there's a change in government. So certainty is really critical for investors. And it's hard, you know, that there's, there's a temptation always to respond to domestic demands that may change, you know, as, as I mentioned in the example of, of Mexico. Um, there, it's something that, that, uh, it has to be maintained over time. Um, I think the, the best approach, you know, coming at this from the State Department perspective and in the past, there are a lot of international agreements that work to create that certainty. And as countries join those, um, it, it does help to create transparency and certainty over the rules of the road for both trade and investments. Um, as African countries have joined the World Trade Organization, they've been very, uh, very knowledgeable, very sophisticated. I used to handle some of those accessions um, in in how these rules impacted the local uh, economies and local opportunities. It's one tool. Again, trade agreements provide a tool uh, to create standards that international investors and uh, or well, international trade, international companies will understand. Um, being able to point to uh, an established uh, way of doing things and established practice and say, this is what we do in our country is always going to be very helpful for investors. And then uh, the yeah, other piece is you can ensure these things. So, you know, that will <laughs> yeah. create some certainty as well. It creates more financial certainty. And and also, yeah, and one last little point. Um, as certainty is created, it reduces risk. And by reducing risk, it actually also reduces the risk 
you know, that, that premium that may be associated with loans and other things like that. So there's a benefit on all sides to this. Um, by creating a certain rule of law environment, it will reduce, reduce a risk premium that, you know, may have to be, you know, in order to obtain capital. So I, I would say that there's a benefit to countries in addition to attracting investment. It, it will, it should help over time, as Ezekiel can probably talk about more than me, to reduce the risk premium associated with loans. Okay, great. We, I, I've got to, I'm going to hand it over to Eric already in, in a couple of minutes. So, I want to give each of you a chance to to give us the golden last minute, the thing you want people to take away. And I want to start with Wilson. What do you What do you want people to take away from from this, from your perspective as an Africa, you know, as an African based small business? Um, what's your one minute uh, takeaway for for everybody that's listening? Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Rob. Yeah, what I, what I want to say is that it, it it's possible for different SMEs to partner and also do business together in, in Africa. Uh, just like, uh, for example, Clinic Masters partnered with Mount Sinai in uh, uh, New York. So any business, the opportunities are there, so it's very possible uh, to partner and work together. But also, importantly, maybe, Rob, uh, someone uh, asked for my contacts on the chat. Maybe you could do help to pass off of that, yeah. Thank ah, you. Okay, so, so we'll try to make that connection uh, All right. uh, directly. Okay. Uh, Leah, maybe you can help us with that. Thank you. So, uh, and Wilson, thank you for that. It is possible, says Wilson. These, you know, these transactions can happen and these partnerships can be, can be made. Yes. Let me hand it to you, Paloma. Uh, what's the one minute takeaway? Sure. I think um, this is no surprise because we've been talking about it a lot today, but I think it's the need for none of this is simple and it's the need for uh, private investors, government, SMEs and development agencies all to be working hand in hand in different angles of public ecosystem and specific private sector deals uh, for, for growth to happen at scale. Fantastic. Uh, um... I want to take uh, now to you, Pamela, the one minute takeaway for, for folks. One minute takeaway is risk can be measured, it can be priced, and it's possible to de-risk through insurance products, uh, and, and it will provide more opportunities uh, to be able to have that kind of backing behind a trade transaction or a potential investment. Um, that should never, it shouldn't be a hurdle. Uh, to expanding internationally because it can, it can be de-risked. Yeah. And I think that that uh, follows on from what Ezekiel said, which is sometimes the perception of risk is also different from the right. reality of risk, and that measurement right. helps to bring that together. Yeah. Ezekiel, I'm going to give you the last word, the one-minute takeaway before we hand it back to Eric. Ezekiel, are you with us? Yes, I am. I think um, I was on mute. Yeah, I mean, my, my one minute take is this. Um, Africa is an investment thesis. Um, it is where you have the higher yields. There are risks, but the risk can be the risk and they can be managed. And more also, um, the U.S. has to come to the party. I mean, um, uh, we need to change the, the, the numbers. I mean, it needs to go up. And the CFTA, the single market, presents a unique and a tremendous opportunity to actually tap into this $3.4 trillion market. But beyond that, the investment in infrastructure is also tremendous. Thank you. Thanks, Ezekiel. I think that the four great points. Wilson says it is possible, and he's, he's shown it uh, with the Mount Sinai transaction. Uh, Boma reminds us it's, it's everybody, it's partnership, it's alliances. Uh, and uh, Elmo says risk can be measured, it can be managed. And Ezekiel says, U.S., come to the party. So I think these, this is a great uh, takeaway. Let me hand it to you, Eric, to sum up for us. Thanks, Rob. I'm, I'm not sure I can sum it up better than those five takeaways. Um, I think that really captures it, that there, there is incredibly exciting economic activity, incredibly exciting investable businesses in Africa. There is a lot of dynamism on the continent. There's a lot of um, business opportunity for investors, a lot of trade transactions that are out there. 
there are a lot of programs, whether they're multilateral um, or they're U.S. programs that can help um, to facilitate that trade, to de-risk those investments. Um, and there's a, a robust private sector in terms of um, helping to facilitate that trade and, and de-risk this transaction as well. Um, I think as we look forward, the, the opportunities in Africa with the, um, the consolidated market are tremendous. The opportunities for trade between Africa and the United States and for investment in Africa are absolutely tremendous. And I think this panel has shown us that there's a lot of really, really exciting work that, uh, that can be done and that uh, the, the variety and shape and complexity of different transactions that can take place um, will you know, continue to evolve and be, uh, be really exciting and really challenging. And thank all of the audience members for joining us today and thank particularly all the panelists. Um, thank you, Ezekiel and uh, Paloma and Pamela and Wilson. And thank you, Rob, for a fantastic job of facilitating. Um, as an APT alumni, we're very proud to have you as part of the family. And uh, it is um, great to hear from all of you and your experience and expertise. And thank you very much for sharing the, the day with us. And this concludes our presentation. So uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks to all. Thanks again to us. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.